when you're a grown up, you have to make serious choices and you have to put aside the desire to be enchanted with your political choices and just do your duty as a citizen. From Christianity Today, you're listening to The Bulletin, a podcast about the people, events, and issues that are shaping our world. I'm Mike Cosper, and I'm joined by Russell Moore and Nicole Martin. Today on our show, New Hampshire. Donald Trump says the race is over. Nikki Haley says, not yet, maybe. Then, TikTok prosperity. And finally, 100 years later, and Vladimir Lenin is still dead. Stay with us. All right, Russell, Nicole, welcome back. Hello. Thank you. So Tuesday night, voters in New Hampshire went to the polls in spite of winning the tiny township of Dixville Notch by a vote of six to nothing. Nikki Haley came up short of her goal of interrupting Donald Trump's sense of inevitability. He won the state with 54% of the vote to her 43%. Joining us to talk about this is Mona Charon. She's the policy editor for The Bulwark and host of the Beg to Differ podcast. Mona Charon, welcome to The Bulletin. Thanks for having me. Okay, so I get it out of the way. I need to start with my mea culpa in December. <laughs> I made the prediction. Momentum was in Nikki Haley's favor. She was going to win New Hampshire. I doubled down on that last week when she got that much sought after Judge Judy endorsement. I was maybe like a quarter of the way right. Like she beat the polls. She beat expectations. Uh, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Just take nice. the crow and eat it. <laughs> but I was wrong. I was wrong. It would have been nice, Mike, if you had been right. Let's yes, put it, it that way. <laughs> In addition to what Mike said, which is clearly, After the results from Dixville Notch came in, when Haley was ahead, then suddenly she was behind. This was rigged, (laughs) obviously. Can we all just agree to that? (laughs) The dump of those later votes. Yeah, That's right. That's right. What did we learn in New Hampshire? Did we learn anything? Or are we where we began? So (laughs) we learned that the fond hopes of people who were thinking that it might be possible to deny the nomination, the Republican nomination to Donald Trump, Mm -hmm. uh, have been dashed, uh, a stake driven through their hearts. And look, there are only two opportunities to prevent the return of Trump to the White House. One is in the primaries and the other is in the general And it would have been great if the Republican Party had chosen to do that. But that is not the Republican Party that exists today. And this certainly puts to bed the idea that there is a silent majority, as one of the Nikki Haley advisors put it, of Reaganites or old-fashioned conservatives who still dominate the Republican Party. Not true. There's a minority of such people in the party, uh, Mm -hmm. but they are no longer the heart and soul of the GOP. Mona, what do you make of the fact that this year you don't have the evangelical signaling that we saw in 2016 or 2020? There are no high-profile television evangelists up there with Trump right now. In your view, is that because that's an already done deal? Yeah. So we did have the Vanderplatz weighing in for Ron DeSantis in Iowa, and that proved to be completely useless. Now, maybe he never really had that much power to begin with. Maybe we're overestimating his influence, but I think it's much more likely. It seems to me that Trump doesn't need to court those voters anymore. They are his most faithful, even Mm -hmm. fanatical followers. And one of the things we were talking before we went on air about Tim Alberta's book, and one of the things that he is so good about outlining is the degree to which there's a in some cases, a replacement of of Trump for Jesus in some churches, where it is like a cult, a religious cult. And by the way, that gives him a lot of leeway on issues that other candidates have stumbled over, like abortion. Trump can say whatever he wants about Mm -hmm. that, and these voters are never going to hold it against him. The exit polling is pretty stark. 70% who identified as evangelical or born again voted for Trump. And in the past, one of the ways people would differentiate, they'd say, look at what happens when you filter for who's actually going to church. 
I believe it was in 2016 where that number kind of plummeted, especially in the primaries. In this one, 62% of those who report weekly church attendance also voted for Trump, which is up. I wonder this, though, to what you were saying a moment ago in terms of the quiet for now among evangelical leaders and preachers and that sort of thing. I wonder if people haven't just been holding their breath and waiting and going, maybe Ron DeSantis knocks him out. Maybe Nikki Haley knocks him out. Maybe we don't have to stick our necks out for for this guy just yet. Everyone's sort of hoping some exogenous event is going to interrupt Trump's inevitability. And then when it doesn't, then you go down to now we're at a binary. Now it's between these two guys and this one's pro-life and that one's pro-choice. And Christians, what are you going to do? I think there has been a tendency on the part of Republicans going back to 2016 where they kept thinking something or someone else is going to solve the Trump problem and I don't have to do it. And I can keep my head down and just wait for the storm to pass. And you've even seen many of them giving quotes along those lines to the papers, anonymous quotes about, we'll just wait. And nothing else has brought him down. And so that cowardice then comes back to bite them because there's no one left to hold him to account. One thing that shocked me in the exit polls was that when you looked at the age breakout, Trump won. Obviously, he won in pretty much all the demographics because of of his margin. He simply won. But with 18 to 29-year-olds, he almost doubled his margin. And I'm thinking about these younger voters. Some of these people are voting for the very first time in a presidential election. What do you think is going on with that? Look, young people look to older people for models. They need leadership. They need to be shown that there is something to aspire to. And when they see all of the people in authority truckling to this guy, they learn that lesson that he's the one to follow. He's the leader. And I cannot stress too much the importance of the leadership in the GOP. This isn't just a Trump problem. It's the fact that you had this sort of comprehensive weakness on the part of leaders, on the part of people like Ted Cruz and Rubio and McConnell and McCarthy and the opinion shapers in conservative media and religious leaders, I should say, to this group, all of whom gave their imprimatur, their stamp of approval to a TV star demagogue with multiple moral deficiencies. And so what are 18 to 29-year-olds to make of it? These are the people whose ideas about the world are just being molded. And so that's how they've been instructed to think. And so they're responding to that. I was more surprised by the number of young people who didn't vote. All of the young people I'm talking to, all of the resources that I'm reading so far indicate that there's just a lack of enthusiasm about this race in general. I saw this quote that I felt like really summed it up. A 17-year-old said Biden, Trump, and Nikki Haley are terrible candidates. I agree with them on pretty much nothing. (laughs) And they're pretty much all just running as alternatives to each other. That statement sums it up for me. There's just a lack of enthusiasm. They don't see one candidate over the other, Democrat or Republican. They just see a bunch of failed candidates. So I would say this is the time when we have to remind young people the importance of voting. And then we have to remind them of values-based voting in a way that allows them to make for compromise and how they make those compromises. That's the part that feels a little sticky. You're so right to bring that up. And who can blame them for thinking these are not ideal choices? But the thing is, these kids are going to have to grow up fast and realize that in this fallen world, as Christians might put it, I'm not a Christian, but I think that's a useful metaphor, that sometimes you don't get to have an exciting candidate. You don't get to have your heart race, as many young people did, say, with Obama or with earlier candidacies. That is nice, but it doesn't always present itself. And when you're a grown-up, you have to make serious choices and you have to put aside the desire to be enchanted with your political choices and just do your duty as a citizen. That's my view. Mona, one of the things that did not come up in Nikki Haley's victory speech (laughs) last night was that she's she, but 
it certainly was the implication behind Donald Trump's victory speech in which he made fun of her dress, suggested that she's going to be investigated and there are things she doesn't want known. What do you think is going to happen to young men in terms of how they view women when you take the E. Jean Carroll case, you take the Access Hollywood case, you take all of this? One of the things that drew me to conservatism in general when I was young was that I grew up in a very liberal environment, and I found that sort of left-wing young men were not very nice to women and took a lot of liberties and didn't think there was anything to be said in behalf of being a gentleman or being respectful. And on the other hand, conservative young men, when I was young, at least had some of that still in their upbringing, that you held the door for a lady and you didn't make unwanted sexual advances and so forth. And I found that there was a certain courtliness that I really appreciated. That is so gone now. Instead, it's the conservative side, it's the right wingers who are engaging in misogynistic humor and who are vulgar about women and who are unrecognizable to me as conservatives. And yet, when you have elevated somebody like Trump, it poisons the culture. I don't hold the right entirely responsible for this. I do think there's blame to go around because I think it wasn't helpful that the left was describing, was never referred to masculinity without the prefix toxic. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I think that was unfortunate. And I think it helped get us to where we are because I think you have to have a wholesome and a healthy masculinity that society upholds and recognizes, because then otherwise men will flock to some kind of masculinity that isn't so healthy. Having said that, there's no excuse for this. These people ought to be ashamed of themselves for talking about women this way, for being completely casual and accepting of what happened in the E. Jean Carroll case. And then, of course, they retreat into their zones of unreality, where they just say, well, I don't believe that. That's all the media spin, or that's all they're out to get him. And a movement that's based on denial of reality is dangerous and, in the end, unsuccessful. Yeah. And it always strikes me that whenever such comments are made about women or about a certain sector, there's always someone, some woman or some person within that sector that's nearby nodding their heads. It's just another reminder that this type of power and influence will always have somebody nearby saying, actually, he might be right because some women are that way, but there are enough people around him to say, eh, it's not entirely wrong. Or to your point, enough people who are willing to close their eyes or their ears and say, he didn't really mean it. Yeah. Almost makes you think they weren't sincere in the past when they upheld certain standards, like when Bill Clinton was accused of misbehavior and they were awfully tough on him. Imagine in any previous era that we're talking about a situation where very recently a judge and jury concluded that this person's guilty of what the judge called rape. And what we're discussing right now is not that, but how big the victory among evangelical Christians will be. That would have made no sense to us in the before times. And even when we talk about women, Mona, your colleague, Sarah Longwell, did a focus group recently with a group of people talking about, you just can't trust women in this kind of leadership. You never know what they're going to do when it's their time of the month and so forth. Oh, Those were women saying know, that. It's Something astounding. that would have been out of an Ali G skit from yeah. years ago. <laughs> no, it's amazing. And of course, no woman has ever led an important nation like Margaret <laughs> Thatcher and oh, Golda yeah. Meir. And, no, it's just, it's just amazing. Angela Merkel, of course, in more recent history. But these sort of kind of antediluvian primitive views were under the surface and Trump has given them all permission to flower again. And you think you've won a battle and then, nope, got to do it all over again. It's not that Trump is standing up there saying, do X, Y, and Z to be a real man. He's being himself, which is misogynistic and grotesque. And it creates the permission structure for everything else 
that follows it. It normalizes so much else. When you took Trump, this reality TV star who was more about performative wealth than actual success in business, it created this standard where all of this performative masculinity, all of this garbage, it transformed our politics. It transformed Hollywood. It transformed so much. I feel like we've as much as we've talked about what Trump has done to American culture, I still feel like we've barely scratched the surface to go, wow, the damage is deep. And one of the things that is a result is that the right doesn't want to talk about the treatment of women and the left doesn't want to talk about the fact that there are women. This is a really <laughs> uh, strange time in which to live. Yeah, it's really worrying. And the furies have been unleashed. It's unclear whether we're going to be able to contain them, but that is our task as we go forward. The furies that have already been unleashed, the misogyny, the anti-Semitism, the bigotry, the desire for secession that we see in, in large parts of the electorate, the distrust of institutions, and in particular, going forward for the next 11 months, we are going to be seeing an all-out assault on the judiciary by mm -hmm. the Trump forces. And so they are going to attempt to undermine trust in all of the courts. And that, and the Justice Department and so forth, that will have long-lasting effects well beyond whatever happens in the election in November. If a big, sizable minority of the country doesn't believe that our basic judicial system is fair and reasonable, that doesn't bode well, obviously. There are so many people who will no longer speak to you or I who said it's all worth it because of the judges. Yeah. And now the judges that were appointed are the ones that are seen as, as the deep state the problem. This is the way societies unravel. It's, it's pretty scary. Yeah, 2024. Here we go. Uh, Mona, <laughs> thank you for joining us for this conversation. We will be right back. There was a fascinating story over at RNS this week. We will link that in the show notes. It brings together a lot of things we've been talking about here at the show over the last year. TikTok, social media, AI. It was a story about an account called Daily Believer. It has almost a million followers since launching in November. It's had almost 9.2 million likes. And it's these animated AI generated images of Jesus. Let's check out the audio from one of these posts. He guided you to this video to say, I am with you. I will never abandon you. Even if others disappoint you, I never will. You, your family, and your future are safe with me. You can hide what's going on inside from everyone, but not from me. Do you believe? If so, comment so I can bless you. Can I ask you something? If you're not already following this profile, click follow to receive more messages of love, faith, and hope. <laughs> that little bit of drama. My sheep hear my voice, but oh, they don't recognize that. Oh, my gosh. Brandon Dean, a scholar of religion, wrote this article. He said, all these Jesuses are long-haired and bearded, recalling artist Varner Salzman's ubiquitous 1940 painting, Head of Christ. Some wear the crown of thorns. Some look alarmingly like actor Jared Leto. Nearly all promise a surprise or good news soon in exchange for the viewer liking, commenting, amening, or sharing it with their friends or family. And of course... If they do, the animated Jesus will then tell them they'll be blessed within the hour. And if not, they've invited woe upon themselves. <laughs> Dean calls it a TikTok chain letter. Mm -hmm. What's wild is because this thing is so successful, these individual posts can make up to $900 a post. I just want to say it again, 9.2 million likes. So this is not, we just went and dug up something weird for, for people to look at. Like this has almost a million followers, 9.2 million people. If this were like a Christian influencer sort of generic Christian influencer that had a, almost a million followers, we'd say, this is a person of some significance. I don't have a million followers. I don't think any of us do. Maybe Russ. Yeah, of course. Which <laughs> only suggests that he needs some very threatening music behind yeah. some of his yeah. <laughs> It was always implied. Maybe we need to make it more explicit. Yeah. The idea 
that there is an exchange if I like this particular thing and follow this particular thing, I will receive the blessings of this particular form of Jesus, which is arguably not Jesus at all. It does hearken to the threads that have been in the undercurrent of American Christianity, but I think global Christianity as well, which is this reciprocity, this kind of genie God that I give a little something. I give my faith, I give my belief, I give my whatever, my money, and I get something in return, a prayer cloth, some holy water or something else. I think that's what it taps into. And that's what makes it so grievous. But it's so funny because it's so outlandish. I just, I can't believe people are actually following this. Y'all know the concept of Uncanny Valley, the way that certain dolls are creepy, certain clowns, because Uncanny Valley says there has to be just enough familiarity to recognize something and strangeness, and it becomes really unsettling. I feel like this is the uncanny valley of the shadow of death. This is astounding just to hear it, but Nicole, what you're saying about prosperity gospel, I can't help but think John Perkins said one time, talking about some prosperity gospel preacher buying jets or something like that, he said, we know what the prosperity gospel is. Prosperity gospel is witchcraft. So there were some people that pushed back on that, and he said, I'll just say it again. And it's not the preaching of the word of the cross. And what you have here is horoscopes or something else, but with a Jesus-y... It's Jesus karma. Yeah. So here's the rub, though. This is a heated conversation I had the other day. The rub is prosperity gospel works for communities who have been oppressed, for poor communities, for people who don't have a worldly way out, and they are taken advantage of, they become vulnerable to the message of prosperity in the gospel. And are we to say that God will not bless you with a bed for those who are sleeping on the street? Are we to say God will not bless you with a job for those who are jobless? I think there has to be a space to say your faith in God does amount to something. The problem is it's not the exchange. It mm-hmm. is the, the, the reality of the cross suggests when I believe my life might get worse. I'm trying to reconcile this need that is clearly visible through these followers. They are responding to messages about protection for their family. They're responding to messages about healing and healing from grief and loss. So is there a place in the gospel that speaks to that? I think the answer is yes. But how do we avoid going the route of the prosperity gospel lane while still acknowledging that there are people and churches and places around the world who are longing for Jesus to deliver them from, in some cases, abject poverty, in some cases, deep issues of pain? The the golden calf appealed to the desire to be led into the promised land. It was not the gospel, and predatory payday loan sharks were serving underprivileged communities that nobody else will serve. They're fleecing those underprivileged Mm -hmm. communities and exploiting the fact that they are in a place of uh, desperation. And this is one of those things where a commitment to the gospel and a commitment to justice, social justice, are the same thing. Stop preying on people's natural need to live and to thrive and to go forward with something that just can't do it. When I first saw it, I was reminded of of something Eugene Peterson once wrote about Psalm 121, I lift my eyes up to the hills. Where shall my help come from? It's the first psalm of ascents. You've got these pilgrims on their way to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. They're traveling through the Judean hillside. And when they turn their eyes up to the mountains, what they're seeing are these high places, these pagan temples on the roadside. And it, it wasn't just, hey, go take an hour and have a break and worship at the pagan temple. Like it was extortion. The the people that ran the temples, if you didn't stop and pay off the temple tax for whatever the local pagan god was, that was also the crew that was going to rob you a mile down the road if you didn't stop. It was a protection racket. And so it was this song is all about having faith that the God who called you to Jerusalem is going to get you there safely and that you don't have to do these transactional things with these little idols in order to get there. And I think that's the key thing that distinguishes a God who blesses people, who ask him for daily bread, whether it's a bed or a job or a food or a paycheck when it's desperately needed, and the prosperity gospel, because the prosperity gospel says, I'm the vehicle 
I'm the one that's going to get you there. You got to deal with me to get what you want from God because I'm the servant he's put here to get your blessing, your prayer towel, your like, your share with your friends, whatever it is. The transaction is the piece that's predatory and that is ultimately, that's what makes it witchcraft. That's what makes it idolatry. And in this case, you have something that's not even a human being. It's AI. (laughs) It reminded me of the prayer of Jabez thing. Do you remember (laughs) Bruce Bruce Wilkinson in the early 2000s? I was part of a congregation that studied that book. And the takeaway was, you're praying the wrong prayer. If you want something (laughs) from God, the prayer is, enlarge my territory. In fact, there was a very popular gospel song that came out around that same time on enlarge. And I remember... Churches of my kind everywhere were singing, enlarge my territory. And I was thinking to myself, I'm I'm just not sure Jesus prayed that prayer. I'm just, I'm not convinced that is the prayer that of what faith looks like. But there are people at my church that will do this and burn sage and run it around their houses and say that they're purifying themselves. This to me only speaks to the fact that we have a major discipleship crisis. I have a friend who took a church one time where when he arrived, they were doing in their Bible studies worry dolls, where they took these dolls and they would tell them their worries and then put them under their pillow so they would go away. And my friend said, yeah, we have something like that. It's called prayer. And what you have are (laughs) idols. This is crazy. I was part of the leadership of a church that took our leadership through study of the prayer of Jabez when it came out yes, that year. Yes, same. I mean, everybody did it. It same. came out. Everybody was like, yes. whoa. And yes. here's, what I, here's what I think people forget about the book, because we can all laugh and look at that and go, really? Like this, whatever. But what I think stuck with people about that book when it came out was there was this sense of be bold and pray. Be bold and tell God exactly what you want. And the book's, if I remember correctly, the book says he might not give it to you, but just be bold and pray it. Pray for it. That's the lesson Mm -hmm. of the thing is that he had the courage to just name his desires before God, and God can sovereignly do what he wants or what he doesn't want. One of the things that I think was remarkable about this AI bot is that if you looked at the top videos, here's the list of the top videos. Grief of a loved one, 4 million views. Protection for my family, 22 million views. Shame about wrong choices and concerns three and a half million views. Perseverance during hardship, 129,000 views. Fears about unfaithful people, 177,000 views. Like the flip side of this story is that on the other end of it, and I think this is what you're getting at, Nicole, people are hurting. Mm -hmm. People are in pain and they're lonely and they don't know where else to take it. And it reminds me of this great Dallas Willard quote. Somebody once said to him, hey, you say you believe in the power of the Holy Spirit to heal people. How come the only people I ever see God healing people through are these weirdos on cable television wearing sparkling white suits or whatever? And Willard sits there for a second and he says, maybe it just so happens that they're the ones with the courage to say in the name of Jesus Christ, be healed. And God heals people through them. And so I think it's one of those it's like it's like Balaam's donkey, right? Like there there is this weird mystery of grace where in these things people who are hurting, 2 million people are not showing up to a, a thing about grief because it's funny. There's something that they're looking for there. There's something that they're connecting with there. And if nothing else, at least it's a clarion call to the church. Hey, we just had a segment about politics and that stuff's really important and the the culture's falling apart, but also Sounds like people are really hurting out there. Mm-hmm. There are hundreds of thousands of people craving the real power of Jesus Christ, and they are not getting it from traditional churches. People don't feel they can encounter the real Jesus in church, in communities. So they're wooed by a fake form of Jesus. That's the pain point for me. But if our churches were authentically speaking of the healing power of God that's available in grief and trauma, if we were sincerely believing God's healing protection over our families, regardless of what uh, sicknesses and issues we encountered, then we would be able to have something to compare it to. I think the larger point you're making here goes to the Something that happened with the old prosperity gospel preachers, there were a lot of people who started seeing, wait, people are responding to these new methods of television and further back radio and all of these other things. We need to be there. 
because if there's not a gospel presence there, then there's not a gospel presence there. It's going to be filled in with something else. Maybe this kind of thing will prompt people who actually do have a burden for the biblical gospel and do know where people are hurting to go to them. All right. Before we wrap this up, let me just ask this. I feel like there's an element in this that I want to be humble about in that I want to say to myself, okay, where's the plank in my eye here? What is it about the culture of of white evangelicalism, of North American evangelicalism, of whatever it is in our sort of milieu here at CT? Where's the plank in our eye where we're thinking transactionally or where we're doing our own sort of versions of witchcraft? Like who? what are the little temples on the hills that, that we're looking to thinking, maybe I'll just stop off and pay off this temple tax and I'll just make sure I get down the road a little further. I think a lot of people, at least I do, find that out in a moment of crisis. So then you start to realize, oh, wait, I had this expectation that God was going to do this. If I'm a faithful person, God owes me that. I found that in my own life, praying for children when we were going through a time of infertility. And I realized I actually was mad at God because I had a prosperity gospel understanding. If I do all that I'm doing and will, would be a good parent, why aren't you giving me children? And I, I do think that's, that's present with all of us. Yeah. Mm. I'm, I'd say the same thing. Even with finances, there are repeated studies that show that Black churches still receive the largest percentage of philanthropic activity within Black communities. So Black people are more likely to give to their churches than they are anyplace else, and yet they still struggle financially. There is a sense that even when you have nothing, you are to give to God through the church, and when you do that, He's going to bless you. And to Russell's point, it's not until you get into a financial crisis that you start to realize, actually, God doesn't care about my money in that way. It is my heart. Where in my heart am I withholding from God? But it, it is so easy for money to be the player. This is why the prosperity gospel is still driving forward today, because it deals with the issue of money. And in terms of healing, one of the reasons I think this happens is because the Bible gives us what to do. James 5, anoint the sick with oil and pray for them. And when you have churches that say, oh, we're too sophisticated for that, or we can't even imagine doing that, somebody's going to fill that void with something bad. On that note, we will be right back. Not long after his death, 100 years ago, a popular poet in the Soviet Union comforted a grieving country with these words, Lenin lived, Lenin lives, Lenin will live. And this is, of course, for those who are part of a liturgical tradition, will recognize in that that this is a recreation of the high point of the Christian liturgy at the serving of the Eucharist when the priest says, therefore, we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. A hundred years have passed, and Lenin is still dead. He does not live <laughs> and will leave his soul to the care of God as to whether he will ever live again. It's interesting. In some ways, you don't hear a lot about Lenin. You hear a lot more about Stalin. And yet, Lenin really is, in many ways, certainly one of the two or three most significant figures of the 20th century. I was reading this morning, responsible for the deaths of as many as 8 million people during his reign. And there's been a lot of writing and reporting as, as this week. Obviously, Russia is in the news. Russia is on the world stage. Vladimir Putin imagines himself in the tradition of these great Russian leaders who expanded the empire, who unified the empire, who held it all together. Before we got into this topic, Nicole, you were talking about Lenin's tomb, his embalming. Yes. And Russ, you said you've been there. Maria and I were there with our very newly adopted sons from Russia just a day after they were adopted in Red Square, where people were going for pilgrimages to Lenin's tomb. It is exactly the same thing that we were just talking about with AI Jesus. People have a need and a hunger to worship. And they have a need for an eschatology. And if they don't have the right one, they're going to make one up. It did strike me the fact that you can still see his body, like his embalmed body. 
when you embalm someone's body and leave it open for the world, you are building an idol. You're building a, a space of worship where people might come and remember who they are as a result of who this person is. Russ, for listeners who maybe are coming into this without a lot of background on this, could you give us like the, the snapshot of the life of Lenin? Like who was Lenin? Mm. Why did he matter? How did he reshape Russia into the Soviet Union? He was the leader, a leader of the Bolshevik uh, revolution, and it was, again, it kind of echoes with what we were talking about earlier. There was a sense of desperation among the Russian people. Something had to be done about their pain and their hurt and the czars, and he was one of those people saying, we can fix it, and this is what will happen. We're going to get you to a worker's paradise where you just look at the promises that were made and the way that the Soviet Union actually developed. And you also see, we mentioned Stalin, Stalin picking up a lot of this and just amplifying it. And it was it, all of these horrible crimes. When you look at it and you say, how did they justify this? Even you take, you step back and say, I mean, communism stupid, no matter what, as an economic theory and as a social theory, you can understand how people could believe it. But how do people justify starving millions of Ukrainians and murdering people, having somebody stick an ice pick through Leon Trotsky's ear to kill him in Mexico? Those, how do you do that? And the reason you do it is by saying, this isn't the best thing to do, but we have to do it because if we don't, we won't have something better. And mm -hmm. the human heart can always justify that, and they did. He was one of the first leaders, and of course, Stalin amplifies it, but then in many ways, Hitler understood their model, the, the sort of ide yeah. the ideology model, which was it's not just this is an economic idea. It's this is the march of history. Mm -hmm. This is where the world is headed. This is where history itself is headed, and we can see it. And what's in the way are the bourgeoisie, the middle class, the czarists, the Jews, whoever it was that was seen as the cause of the suffering for everyone else. And so part of what made murder possible in the Soviet Union is, and, and what made murder possible in the Nazi regime and, and elsewhere was that you turned human beings into obstacles to the march of time, the mm -hmm. march of history. And so you dehumanize them in this way that was very much, yeah, it's dirty work, but somebody's got to do it because where we're headed is so much more important than where we are right now. And it seems like his success at that is like – one of the darkest legacies of the 20th century because it gets repeated there. Mm -hmm. It gets repeated by Mao. He took this idea of violent revolution and made it work in a horrific way. Yeah. And one of the things that really interests me is looking at the history of American communists who were influenced by Lenin. What happened once they found out about Stalin's crimes? When mm -hmm. Khrushchev stood up and just let all of this be known, you had one group of people who said... That's not what I signed up for and, and left uh, disillusioned. You had another group of people who just adjusted to it, found a way to justify it and to move on. And there's something really interesting, I think, about human nature in that. I think you've seen that with uh, some of the response to October the 7th, right? Yeah. Again, you have these revolutionary ideologies. And in the immediate aftermath, there were some people who said, this is what revolution is. What do you guys expect? You expect mm -hmm. it to be neat and clean. But you had a lot of people who were sympathetic to Hamas, sympathetic to the militant side, saying there were no sexual crimes, they didn't behead any children, all of this kind of stuff, and then adjust or grow very quiet rather than actually address the sort of underlying ideological problem when that stuff becomes clear. Yeah, we can give permission to a lot. Yeah, and one of the other interesting things here is the justification for keeping Lenin's embalmed body is we're replacing the old antiquated Russian Orthodox Church with all of its pilgrimages and so forth. And now we see a time where the Russian Orthodox Church standing up and blessing Vladimir Putin and blessing the invasion of Ukraine – they didn't kill the Russian Orthodox Church, but they got the Russian Orthodox Church to imitate them. Hmm. So that part is the part that feels scary to me. And if we were to make a drastic kind of bridge between Lenin and the Orthodox Church following behind him, 
I think we could probably see some similar parallels with Trump. This is a sense of dictatorship that if we're not careful, the dictator leads the faith group as opposed to the faith group setting the stage and saying, no, there shall be no other God besides God. The hope is anyone who tries to be a dictator, anyone who tries to be the one to be worshipped will soon fade away. But the scary part is it is possible for one person to rise up and become a dictator. Is that possible in the United States? I'd like to believe that our systems are such that would never happen, but now I don't know. I think the frightening thing about our moment is that you have a lot of people who seem content to say, oh, I've held the last time. I'm sure we'll be okay. <laughs> Let's all do nothing. Something will definitely yeah. happen. This morning I was listening to a podcast with Matt Continenti was on the podcast, and he would, they were talking about this exact phenomenon. And he said, here's what I think people need to understand about a, a second Trump administration is that everyone said the grownups are in the room and they'll restrain them. They're all gone now because they all hate Trump and he's never going to hire them again in all this. So whatever happened before, at minimum, mm. imagine it just a little bit worse. All right. On that note, thanks to all of you for listening. Hey, if you like the show, take a minute and uh, make sure you're subscribed. Leave us a review. Leave us a rating in iTunes. We're not going to promise you that God is going to <laughs> bless you if say. that's the case. But it does help other people find the show. And if you want to support the show, again, we're not going to bless you. But we're going to bless you with the show. Do all of that and subscribe to CT as well. You'll find a link for that in our show notes. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. The Bulletin is a production of Christianity Today. It's executive produced by Eric Petrick and Mike Cosper. It's produced by Clarissa Mall and Matt Stevens. Post-production by TJ Hester. Our art for this episode is by Rick Shooks. Music by Dan Phelps. And social media by Kate Lucky. Thanks for listening.